Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Joserich. There's probably no U.S. president more controversial than Andrew Jackson. He was controversial in his time in the first half of the 19th century, and he remains a controversial and polarizing figure today, and his legacy is full of complexities. Along with having his portrait on the $20 bill, today he is best remembered as a man who owned hundreds of slaves and for his policies of Indian removal. But before the civil rights movement, he was better remembered for taking on the big money interest of his day, even bringing down the Second Bank of the United States, a precursor to the Federal Reserve, and he helped champion the spread of democracy to poor white males. He's also remembered as one of the founders of the Democratic Party. Today we're going to be in conversation about this complex history and about Andrew Jackson as a populist. My guest for this is David S. Brown. David Brown teaches history at Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania, and he is the author of the book that he joins us to talk about that's now out in paperback. It's called The First Populist, The Defiant Life of Andrew Jackson. David Brown, it is my good pleasure to welcome you back to this program. Thank you, Jess. Uh, good to be with you as well. The controversy is so deep that we see it going through the Oval Office. President Barack Obama, uh, there, there, for a long time, there has been a, a portrait of Andrew uh, Jackson mm -hmm. in the Oval Office. President Bar Barack Obama brought that portrait down. President Donald Trump put that portrait back up. President Biden brought that portrait back down again. It, it's fascinating to me in this polarizing time that we're living in what the image of Andrew Jackson provokes for people today. You know, that's something because um, uh, Jackson used to be a fairly ecumenical figure, um, uh, you know, sort of ranked very high in presidential rankings, uh, number five, six, seven, that's dropped. Um, you mentioned uh, who has and hasn't had Jackson up on the White House uh, over office walls recently. Um, Bill Clinton, uh, a Democrat, uh, had Jackson up. Ronald Reagan had Jackson up. Now, we tend to think of them as belonging to much different political persuasions. Um, but Jackson had escaped some of those political wars, some of the culture wars, up until, oh, about the, about the late 90s. And then he's, he's become um, cannon fodder as well. Uh, I think for both the left and the right, Jackson's historical reputation, um, it continues to intrigue us, which I think is why, unlike most chief executives, there's only a handful that we actually come back to from time to time, including Jackson's, because the man, uh, you mentioned the bank war, um, there's other things on his vita that make him, um, uh, for better or for worse, relevant to, to, to Americans, whether it was to Americans concerned about centralized financial power in the Great Depression, uh, whether it's Americans who had that same concern today, along with other concerns, um, Jackson has always been a go-to guy, uh, someone to look to, for better or for worse, um, for those characteristics, for those qualities, for those principles and policies in our, in our governments and also in the ways that we think of ourselves as Americans. For better or for worse, consequential. Very consequential. Uh, as I've noted, Jackson's reputation has changed markedly over the years. Um, people who would have embraced him, say, in the 1930s, 1940s and 50s, for his um, uh, attack on the National Bank of the United States, um, uh, that was the key part of his reputation. But then by the 1960s and 1970s, uh, with the long civil rights movements, um, the women's movements, uh, the general cultural trend and drift at that time, Jackson becomes known mostly for Indian removal and for the enslavement um, uh, of Americans, um, uh, African Americans. And this has become, I think, in the last half century, the defining characteristic of Jackson's historical reputation. Um, in other words, it's, it's fungible, it's changeable. And in a sense, it doesn't say as much about Jackson as it does about our uh, uh, evolving as a nation and, um, uh, and as a people. The art of historiography how the stories change through time. That's right. Revision is the name of the game. And, um, you know, this struck me, um, you know, uh, Mitch, I remember when I was a, just a, 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 an undergraduate student, I was taking a course on historiography. And even then, with, with very little background in history, it, it struck me how much Andrew Jackson's reputation had changed, sort of generation after generation, um, to, to meet the needs 
of whatever that generation required in regards to you know, um, identifying themselves as Americans in 1860, 1880, 1930, or 2023. The one thing that has not changed is he has remained controversial, even in his day. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, he was easily the most controversial chief executive that America had at that time. Um, uh, Abraham Lincoln was controversial because there was a civil war. Uh, Jackson was, um, um, I, I can't say a peacetime president conclusively because there was a, um, uh, there was a Seminole War that was going on. Um, but, but, but Jackson uh, you know, largely reigned in what Americans would see as, as a time of peace. Uh, he was the head of the country's most popular party. Uh, so he often spoke as a, as, as a majoritarian. And um, uh, yet, uh, he, um, uh, he was incredibly controversial. He didn't, he didn't um, uh, take the office uh, in an easy way. Uh, he was a, um, uh, a bit of a rabble rouser. Um, he had strong beliefs. And he was very interested in projecting his agrarian uh, states' rights vision onto the country with political appointments and Supreme Court appointments, and engaging in fights from time to time um, with um, with Congress and and with the Senate, including um, over the issue of um, of Indian removal and uh, the um, uh, eradication of the Second National Bank of the United States. What was the Seminole War? And I ask that because it's, I think it's interesting. Oftentimes in history, when we think of U.S. wars, we only see U.S. wars with other mm -hmm. foreign powers. Um, rarely do we remember the wars with indigenous people as, as wars that we you know, classify as wars. So what was the Seminole War? There were a series of Seminole Wars. Um, as, a, as a soldier, pre-presidential, Jackson was engaged in the first Seminole War. Um, against the Seminole peoples in um, uh, in Florida, and this was in the late eighteen um, uh, teens. And uh, Jackson's army um, they uh, they went to Florida um, pretty much illegally. It was Spanish territory, and Jackson had um, orders to follow Seminoles out of Georgia into their homesteads in Florida, and uh, and route them. and um, And so he he carried he carried that out. Um, the Seminole people uh, remained in Florida, and in fact, you know, would even remain in Florida um, uh, after, in smaller numbers, obviously, after Indian removal. Um, the Seminole War that Jackson was uh, was president during was the Second Seminole War, and um, this was a um, this was a, um, a hard fought affair. Um, not not terribly large numbers, um, but very hard fought. And the historian Henry Adams said uh, um, uh, later in the century that the Seminoles made the American military um, pay for every acre that, that it took. Um, it, was, it was not a particularly popular war. It was not a war that was projected widely throughout the culture. Um, and uh, and, and it, was, it was part of the, um, the larger uh, removal process that would result in the late 1830s in the Trail of Tears. So it is, you, you see a direct line between the Seminole War and then the Indian, there's the Indian Removal Act of 1830. This is something that's passed by Congress. Um, this would lead to the uprooting of, of many indigenous people in the southern United States. Many of them would be moved to other parts of the country, including Oklahoma. That's how now Oklahoma, so we have so, so, so much land that belonged to indigenous folks in Oklahoma now. But you see, you see a, a connection here. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, um, uh, uh, Seminoles were removed, um, uh, many by boat, uh, taken across the um, uh, the Gulf of Mexico into uh, into um, uh, Mississippi and Louisiana, and then from there, um, uh, you know, sort of you know, force marched and whatnot into, as you mentioned, uh, the West and part of the Oklahoma Territory. And this is where we get the the Trail of Tears. That's right. Um, the there 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 were several removals. And they took place over a number of years. Um, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, uh, Seminole, Cherokee, and others. Um, when, when we use the, um, the term Trail of Tears, I think, I think in a general sense, I, I think we're referring to this, this entire period, this entire trauma. Specifically in the historical context, 
Um, it refers to the removal of the Cherokee um, uh, in, in um, 1837, which was the year after Jackson had left office. And that's when um, people began to use the, uh, that, uh, that phrase, the Trail of Tears. Well, what's interesting to me is that this is actually part of the creation and maybe even the beginning of the creation of what would become the American South. Oh, very much. Uh, in, in fact, you know, Jackson, if you look at Jackson's record as a, as a whole, um, his record as a military officer in which during the Creek War, which is part of the War of 1812, largely conducted in Alabama, uh, the Creek Nation um, uh, was uh, basically broken by an American force under Jackson at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend uh, and in some other places as well. And so Jackson played a key role first as a military officer in, in, in uh, eradicating um, a lot of Native American power in the Southwest. Um, uh, and then under the presidency of, um, of, uh, of Monroe, serving to negotiate treaties in which um, oftentimes by fraud, uh, he would get um, uh, contracts signed, which would um, give Americans this territory. And then, as if to complete the process, when he was chief executive, then, as you noted, uh, in 1830, he um, put um, any removal on the agenda, and Congress passed this very narrowly in the House of Representatives. I think it went five votes, and it passed in the House of Representatives. But this gave the U.S. government um, the power to negotiate, supply money for treaties to, 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 to carry this process out. So... In a number of ways, a number of formats, Jackson was the leading person in, in carrying out a, um, uh, a decades-long process of the removal of um, Native peoples in the Southeast, the Southwest. Uh, most of them engaged in free labor. Some had slaves, but most of these Natives engaged in free labor. And, of course, what will replace them will be a vast um, cotton belt, cotton complex of, uh, of unfree labor. Yeah, this is this is where we get the cotton belt. It comes after Indian removal, and so there's a very strong connection. I think oftentimes, and I think I have been guilty of this. I saw both these two really negative marks on Andrew Jackson's record of you know owning. I, I've seen it estimated as uh, as many as 300 slaves, uh, being a slave owner, and then Indian removal as almost two separate things. But no, they're they're very much connected with the creation uh, of the American absolutely. South. Absolutely. Yeah, Jackson. I don't think that Jackson had a um, had a um, um, uh, a written out plan here. I don't think that this is, is something that was you know necessarily well thought out. It was it was expedient. Um, it was of the moment. There was a mentality, or there was a logic behind this, um, and uh, uh, and we might even we might even wonder to the extent that Jackson was absolutely necessary to the process in that um, previous presidents had also um, removed um, uh, to the point of their power, the capability, the size of the American military at that time, those times, Native Americans. Um, uh, I think what happens in the 1820s and 30s is that there was a point where the United States had enough power. Its military was of such a size. I mean, it wasn't huge, but it was of such a size. And very, very importantly, the War of 1812 was over. And the British no longer represented a threat that that the, the United States could then begin to impose its power on Native peoples um, in a more systemic way than it had before. Uh, and also, the federal government was receiving a great degree of pressure from individual states, particularly Georgia, to carry out these removals. And if the federal government wasn't going to, the states were going to. And if the federal government would try to oppose that, um, would, would, would that have been realistic? Would that have been possible? Andrew Jackson is also remembered as a president who was seen as a champion for poor citizens. And when I say poor citizens, we're talking about poor white males. Um, is, this, is this process of what's happening in the South benefiting poor whites? Yeah, it's an interesting question because... Um, Economically, it's, it's not clear that it necessarily did. Obviously, it benefited some people, um, but um, uh, you know, the antebellum South, and, and that's 
in a sense, also what we're covering here. The antebellum self um, was not necessarily friendly to poor whites. Um, uh, uh, There's a lack of a public school system. Um, health wasn't particularly good. Um, labor was, um, uh, in some respects, demeaned because it was recognized um, as um, uh, farm labor, for example, the kind of work that enslaved men and women did. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, in the 1850s, there was a South Carolinian by the name of um, Henton Helper who wrote a book about the impending crisis. And uh, he wrote from the perspective of, of, a, of a white man uh, who wasn't part of the, the plantation or the, the, um, uh, the planter oligarchy, who said that the system that we have now, it really isn't very friendly um, for white men, for poor white men in the South. It, it, works, it works against them. Um, on the other hand, uh, if the question is, um, was the self-esteem of these poor perhaps enhanced because they um, uh, were not the bottom class, there was another Southerner, uh, a Georgia senator who said in the 1850s that all societies have what he called a mud sill class, that is the lowest class. And he said, our white, uh, our white population in the South is contented because they are not the mud sill class. Is that John so C. Thought, Calhoun? Um, oh, who was? It wasn't Calhoun. Um, uh, the man's uh, name escapes me now. He was, was a senator from Georgia. I was just thinking about John C. Calhoun's justification for slavery uh, rested on that you would create a, a, an aristocracy of race, and and this because of, he argued that because of slavery, poor whites were able to participate in democracy. Yeah, absolutely. There, you know, there was an historian um, in the 1940s who who wrote a very interesting uh, article uh, on uh, Calhoun, and it was entitled "The Marks of the Master Class." Uh, and what he meant by that was, um, you know, uh, religion. Uh, the opiate of the masses, um, for Calhoun, slavery in a sense uh, fulfilled this function. What 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 kept the rebellion, the class rebellion, from happening um, was racism. That was his argument. Yeah, yeah. No, Marxists were interested, not not supporting John C. Calhoun and his justification for slavery, but there was an interest in how he how, in the argument that he made and how you keep class rebellion from occurring. Did, did with Andrew Jackson? This is also kind of early maybe early years you'll correct me on that but part of what would be of west western expansion is are our poor whites benefiting from the removal of indigenous people um by by getting land did, did, did was there yeah were people getting land through this settlers they dig it. yeah they, they they dig it land there was a, a tremendous amount of land that um that was opened up in in, in the west um opened up very quickly um, uh, this is a process that in some sense uh, would, after the Civil War, continue again. And um, uh, so in, in, in the sense of, of, of um, providing for individual homesteads, um, family homesteads, uh, that, did, that did happen. This is Letters and Politics. We are in conversation with David Brown. We're talking about his book, The First Populist, The Defiant Life of Andrew Jackson. What do you mean by calling Andrew Jackson the first populist? So I think of this in presidential terms. You know, Jackson was the first a few things as a president. And uh, and one of these includes being a populist. He was the first, he was, he was our seventh president. He was the first president not to have been born in Massachusetts or Virginia. Massachusetts and Virginia were, in a sense, quasi-aristocratic um, uh, states. Um, uh, they had been you know, uh, pretty much the two leading colonies, it was assumed, and this is what happened for a generation or two, that um, uh, the um, uh, the epicenter of American leadership would likely come from these two areas. And they did. So so here's Andrew Jackson, who, who could not have been elected president in the 1790s or the 18 teens, in part because of, um, because of his background. Uh, we don't know exactly where he was born, somewhere on the hazy North Carolina, South Carolina border. Uh, he becomes the first chief executive to, um, to live west of the Appalachian Mountains. And uh, he, he becomes a figure that is seen by a majority of Americans to represent themselves. Um, they don't identify necessarily with Boston. They don't uh, identify necessarily with the elite squirearchy of Virginia. 
But this Andrew Jackson, who obviously was, was himself a very privileged individual, um, but they see him and they read him as they want to, which is a, um, a Western man. And increasingly, uh, even before Indian removal, um, Americans are moving to the West in, in larger numbers. Uh, so one of the reasons why Andrew Jackson can be president one day uh, in the 18, late 1820s, 1830s, is because the electoral map has shifted and there are uh, there's an increasing number of Americans in the West who regard Jackson as, as one of their own. When Jackson is president, uh, he will declare that he is in fact um, a champion of, of the common man, um, farmers, uh, laborers, mechanics, that he is not an elitist, that he is the voice of the people. And uh, there might be a bit of posturing there, um, but you also get the sense, um, uh, not just reading his letters and communications, but also looking at his actions, that in fact, uh, he did see things that way, that he, he did see the East, um, which is re represented to him as a, um, uh, as a place where the National Bank sat in Philadelphia, um, a bank for elites. Uh, he looked at its political culture, which he thought somewhat corrupt, had denied him the presidency when he had more popular votes and electoral votes in the 1824 election, but was not given the presidency. Nobody had a, nobody had a majority in the Electoral College. It went to Congress. Where's Congress at? Congress is, is, is in the East. And he argues that it stole the election. He argued not, that he, that election was stolen from him. Yeah. Again, again he had the most vo yeah. votes of all the candidates. He just didn't have the majority. That's right. And he said that the election was stolen from the American people. Uh, by which, um, uh, I don't really think he meant all the American people. I, I think that he meant people who were living, for example, um, in western Pennsylvania, people who, who lived in the Midwest, people who lived you know, beyond the trap, uh, beyond the Appalachian Mountains. And, and, and so when he comes to office, um, he begins to, um, through removal of, 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 uh, of office, um, put in more partisans from, from the West. Now, he would play politics, too. These would be people who would obviously be loyal to the Democratic Party, to his party and to himself. But on the other hand, uh, he, he did have a point in that the country was growing and expanding. And these Westerners, they were, um, uh, they were serving the military. They were paying their taxes. They were Americans, too. And, and they also wanted now their share in governing their nation. And they saw Jackson as as the lead in that effort. In the telling of the story of Andrew Jackson, as we already mentioned, what's foremost these days is slavery and Indian removal. And I think they should be. These are, these are huge events, important events that, that should be known and should be at the front. That said, I think what we have forgot about in this process is what was called the bank wars or the bank war and i didn't know about this until one day a few years ago i just picked up arthur schlesinger's book the age of jackson which was really criticized for again not paying a lot of attention to indian removal and and slavery um but once i started reading about the bank war i i was kind of shocked that something like this happened what was the bank war the bank war was Andrew Jackson's vetoing of the second national bank of the United States. And this is a central bank, right? This is like a central bank, like a precursor. I said in my introduction, a precursor to the Federal Reserve. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, the, the, the history of the bank um, had always been contested. There was, there was a first national bank. There was a precursor. Alexander Hamilton, um, uh, who's in Washington's cabinet, Secretary of the Treasury, he proposes this. Um, he's a New Yorker. Uh, he believes in trying to create an aristocracy of wealth and talent because the American Revolution has ended and we don't have a titled aristocracy. Hamilton is a bit of an elitist and he thinks that you know the best should govern. And uh, why don't we create a financial aristocracy? The bank will facilitate this process. Um, Thomas Jefferson, uh, a Virginian, who's also in the cabinet, Secretary of State, he opposes this. George Washington will side with Hamilton and the first national bank goes into existence. It has a 20 year charter. The charter ends um, uh, right about the time that the United States is gonna fight the War of 1812. The Jeffersonians who are now in power, let that bank 
slide. Um, it, it goes out of existence, and um, the country finds it's very difficult to fight a war without a central bank. So the Jeffersonians actually uh, create the second national bank in 1816. It's got a 20-year charter, 1836. This overlaps Jackson's presidency. Jackson says that the bank, in fact, is designed primarily for elites. And he says foreigners. There's a lot of British subjects who own stock in the bank. The bank is a, um, a government-created entity, um, but most of the people on its board uh, are private citizens. And it will provide loans to help to um, create internal improvements, factories, canals, bridges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to private individuals who will then presumably get rich off this stuff. Um, but it's not a mom and pop bank. So Jackson says, not only is there nothing that explicitly gives us the right in the Constitution to add this bank, others like Washington and the Supreme Court had disagreed on this, um, but uh, he, uh, Jackson also says, I think it creates an artificial um, uh, uh, society here of aristocrats. And, and therefore, it harms the republic. And uh, we'll either have the bank that is a, a kind of um, all-powerful economic institution telling us what to do, or we'll have a people's republic. But he said, you can't have both. And so in the name of, of preserving uh, Republican governments and democracy, as he saw it, uh, he, um, uh, after Congress passed the, the, uh, the, uh, the veto bill, I'm sorry, the recharter bill, Jackson vetoed it. Who is Nicholas Biddle? Nicholas Biddle was the president of the bank. Um, Nicholas Biddle and Jackson were, um, uh, were enemies um, because they were obviously on opposite sides of the fence here. Biddle very much wants uh, to renew the charter. And in doing so, um, he, he kind of um, inadvertently played into Jackson's hands. Uh, for example, he did use bank money um, to, to play politics, to push money in the direction of newspapers and of congressmen and senators like Daniel Webster, who would speak in favor of the recharter. So in other words, if Jackson says, um, there's a conspiracy, you know, um, the bank is out to you know, harm my administration, the bank is out to harm the interests of the American people, it might sound like a conspiracy, but then when you read about how, you know, Biddle is in fact playing the political process, you said there might be something to it. Uh, the consensus is that um, um, the, country, the country needed um, some type of a centralized banking structure. Uh, we learned that uh, during the American Civil War, when um, uh, uh, the war proved to be such, aside from its deadly, deadly, deadly uh, nature, an incredibly expensive affair. Uh, and then in the, in the late 19th century, um, struggling without a central bank and, and having um, uh, uh, political parties like the Greenback Party, like the Populist Party, rise up and demand economic um, reform to, as you note, uh, in the early 20th century, in 1913, to then have a Federal Reserve, which will do that, um, you know, we, we went about, you know, uh, oh, about 80 years or so without that type of structure. And um, uh, in many respects, it really wasn't the healthiest thing for the country to go through, um, to, to, to not have some type of centralized financial system. Um, I, 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 think, um, I think there was an opportunity there, perhaps if Jackson had been chief executive, to have reformed the bank and, and brought it more under uh, uh, federal oversight um, without without destroying it. Was issues concerning the Second Bank of the United States big with the public? Is, is, is it something that Andrew Jackson campaigned on? Absolutely. Uh, the veto comes down in the summer of 1832, and Jackson's running for re-election that fall. And Jackson um, was running against Henry Clay. Henry Clay was a proponent of the bank. And so in one sense, um, it was... Clay versus Jackson. In another sense, one could see the uh, the election being something as a plebiscite for voters on, do I agree with the bank or do I not agree with the bank? 
and and Jackson won a, a strong re-election. But, um, um, he won something like um, 54, 55 percent of the uh, the popular vote, which uh, in today's politics would be considered something you know pretty near to a landslide. Didn't the bank, in response, try to tank the economy? There was a bit of that. Um, uh, and again, this was this was a, a black mark on Biddle's record. Um, so Jackson's concerned that um, the bank, which the bank's charter doesn't end until 1836, and the veto comes down in 1832. So Biddle has four years yeah. to play around with, um, and so to to try to um, limit Biddle's power, Jackson. Um, uh, uh, asks his secretary of the treasury to um, to take incoming funds owed to the government and not put them into the bank, but to put them into other banks. Um, and so Biddle's power will be limited. Um, while this is going on, um, Biddle is also, um, he's got less money. He's contracting loans. Um, he's, um, he's, um, he's bringing as much money as he can bring in and he's not loaning money out. And this has a um, detrimental impact on the American economy. Jackson escapes this largely um, because there will be a panic. And the panic, uh, that was the word uh, used back then. Today we might say recession, or depending upon the severity, even a depression. But this happens in um, 1837, um, the year that Martin Van Buren, Jackson's handpicked successor, becomes chief executive. And it dogs Van Buren. And it's one of the chief re reasons why Van Buren um, loses his bid for re-election in 1840. Um, so yes, um, Biddle um, 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 uh, played politics and he looked, as you know, to sort of tank the economy to demonstrate that the bank was necessary and to try to, in some respect, maybe scare Congress into overriding Jackson's veto. That didn't work. Um, but then again, it wasn't all clean for Jackson because he leaves office in the country um, uh, has a uh, has a, uh, a financial crisis it has to deal with. Was this crisis caused by what the bank did? I mean, maybe it's hard to answer definitively, but clear. But it, it sounds like it at least played a role. It it absolutely did play a role. Um, other things played uh, a role as well, uh, including the fact that when Jackson when Jackson vetoes the bank, the bank had had always been been well not always, um, but um, when the bank had learned how to deal with the crisis situation. There was a, a panic in 1819. The bank didn't deal with it too well, but I think it kind of learned its lesson. So um, uh, it had tried to make sure that um, excessive capital speculation wasn't entering the economy. And the way it would do that is it would regulate mom and pop banks because it would hold some of their notes with the understanding that they could then at any time go to those banks and demand their money back. And the bank would have to have those funds available. When the National Bank is going out of business, it ceases to operate as a, as a break on excess of speculation. So earlier, you and I were talking about Indian removal. So all of a sudden, all this land is opened up in the West. Speculators, bankers help to finance that. There's over-speculation. And so that overspeculation is part of the reason uh, that um, that there will be this crash. Um, the bank did serve some useful, some necessary purposes. Regulation, it couldn't do this any longer. So the reasons why we have this um, uh, this panic in 1837, uh, they're numerous, and 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 I think that both Jackson and Biddle um, they do share uh, some of the complicity on this. Another interesting historic figure that's a part of this history, including with the War Bank, is none other than Roger Taney. Roger Taney is infamously remembered for the Dred Scott decision uh, when he was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he was put there by, by Andrew Jackson. But before that, he was Andrew Jackson's Attorney General, and he also was an economic populist, a racist, but an economic populist. Uh, very much so. Um, I mentioned this panic in 1819 and um, uh, Western land speculation, and um, uh, it really it really hurt um, uh, landholders in the West. And there were a number of groups um, 
uh, and parties and partisans who looked at that and really saw the bank as a particular evil. And, uh, and I think that Tani was among that group. So I, I mentioned that, that Jackson was looking to neutralize the power of the bank by not putting incoming funds into, into it. Um, the bank did have a contract with the U.S. government to do that. And so when Jackson asked his secretary of the treasury, uh, Louis McLean, you know, put the money someplace else. McLean said, I can't. Uh, it's, it's against the law not to do that. So McLean got shuffled elsewhere. Jackson then hired, um, uh, or I should say appointed, uh, a Philadelphian, um, uh, a guy by the man name of uh, Dwayne, to do that. And, uh, and he also said, uh, I can't. It'd be against the law. So as a third pick, um, Jackson brought Tawney as an acting cabinet member uh, to do that. And in fact, Tawney did. Tawney um, uh, did a lot of research, um, looking at, uh, at banks that would accept the funds, because some wouldn't. And, um, uh, and then when, when that was done, then the money began to flow into what were known as pet banks, um, meaning that they were Jackson's preferred banks. Uh, I should mention that one of Jackson's, I think, very good reasons for being critical of the bank is that it played politics. On the other hand, and we know this from correspondence, that um, one of the criteria for getting the government's money and becoming a pet bank was that um, you, you had to you had to support Jackson and Jackson's bank policy. So yes, you're right. Um, uh, Jackson was loyal to his friends, and and Tawney, who was one of the primary authors of Jackson's bank veto message, which is iconic because it's very class conscious. Uh, when, when, when Jackson finds it difficult to find someone who will carry out his wishes, the Treasury Department, um, Tawney will do this, and, and very loyal to his friends, when John Marshall dies, the Chief Justice in the Supreme Court, Jackson then will appoint Tawney to serve. And, and, and Tawney is known as a, um, as a justice um, who, who has a, a, a localist, a states' rights perspective, in contrast to his predecessor, Marshall's, um, say, more broader nationalist perspective. Yeah, I mean, just Roger Taney in this story. It was already complex, this story. When we're talking about Andrew Jackson. Um, I think Roger Taney introduction into the story, his role in the bank in the bank war, and then, again, being the chief justice who wrote the decision, uh, one, one of the, could remember today as one of the worst decisions, the Red Scott decision, um, Put him in there, and the contrast is even, and the complexities are even deeper uh, in in this story. What what more can you tell me about Andrew Jackson's veto message to the second yeah, bank? So, yeah, Jackson Jackson um, pretty much calls out wealth, uh, and he says, "This is a paraphrase." Um, he says, "It's not clear to me why this government should enhance the opportunities of those." Who've already um, been so privileged and have so much wealth, and why we should create laws that will um, only give them more wealth and more opportunities, particularly if it comes at the expense of the working people of this country. That's why I mentioned earlier. Um, that's about as class conscious as a president is going to get. This was not uh, an ecumenical statement. He was drawing lines. Um, Perhaps even some of this was personal. Um, when he was younger, uh, Jackson had uh, uh, engaged in uh, some speculation and, um, and lost um, actually quite a bit of money. And perhaps he too held um, the bank, but more broadly, the financial system, the system of speculation um, uh, uh, in line for that. And so in this bank war, um, and I think that this, this, that this really did actually enhance his popularity, um, uh, again, suggesting how many Americans saw themselves as, as not being elite, maybe not even aspiring to be elite, but that they were the real heroes. They were the bone and sinew of the country. Um, uh, you know, kind of like if you go to, to Concord, Massachusetts today, and you go to, um, you know, um, uh, the bridge where, you know, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the Americans um, met the British 
uh, one of the early battles of the American Revolution. You know, today there's a statue there. There's a statue of the Minuteman. And um, uh, he's, he's holding a musket ready to defend home and hearth, but also he has his uh, hand on a plow so that when the war is over, he can then go back to go back to farming, go back to being a simple, you know, uh, agrarian Republican. That was the idolized image. And so when Jackson's calling out, uh, uh, you know, you know, great wealth, um, he was doing so in a culture that was not a culture particularly attracted to or impressed by celebrity. Maybe a culture a bit different than our own today. There's this term I've heard all my life, never really fully grasped, and that's Jacksonian democracy. What what is that? What does that mean? Yeah, so Jacksonian democracy is supposed to uh, indicate a break from what came before, um, and what comes before is presumably um, less Republican, more aristocratic rule. Um, to say Jackson democracy is to recognize the great migration out of the East uh, of so many Americans into the, um, uh, the, uh, the Midwest, uh, into the Southwest. And, and these people uh, embodying a strain of republicanism, um, presumably a work ethic um, that, that defines them as uniquely American. Um, by the late 1890s, there'll be an historian, Frederick Jackson Turner, uh, Turner who will, will, in a very famous essay, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, will essentially lionize that, uh, that vision of Jacksonian democracy. That somehow, you know, people in Boston and Philadelphia, New York, they, they weren't true Americans. And of course, when he, Turner, is writing this in the 1890s, um, uh, 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 presumably, uh, uh, the impact of, of European immigration into Eastern cities is on his mind. The true Americans are those who went into the interior and, and were pioneers. And through the pioneering process, um, you know, somehow became better, more sufficient Democrats. Um, but it is true that um, with the uh, inclusion of these Western states in the Union, that um, property rights qualifications for white men uh, were, were dramatically lessened. And so it is true that, um, that the number of um, um, presumptive voters did increase dramatically uh, uh, in the 18 teens and 20s and 30s. Now, this is before Jackson becomes president, that, that suffrage is extended to poor white males. What, what, what does Jackson do? For, what does Jackson do? Yeah, as uh, president. I, for, you know, I, I think in a therapeutic sense, um, you know, we, we mentioned uh, the bank war veto. Uh, I think I think that that message, aside from being um, uh, lethal, I mean, it did have effect. It did take out the bank. It was also therapeutic. It told these um, uh, it told these people, uh, this group, this constituency, most Americans, that in fact um, they were right. That, um, that there were elites in the East, um, that, that maybe uh, the bank pandered to that kind of a prejudice, and that um, the best Americans were those Americans who, um, who, who, who earned their labor, um, uh, farming, being mechanics. Um, and so we're talking about a big process here. I mean, you know, you can even step away from the, uh, the Jackson context or the American context and talk about the process of westernization or modernization or the impact of industrialization. This is all caught up and captured in this process. And if we're looking at how it crystallizes in the 18 teens, 20s and 30s, what does it mean? It means um, Indian removal. It means uh, the expansion of enslavement. It means perhaps the suspicion of elite institutions like the bank uh, on the part of interior populations. And uh, politically, uh, it comes into play with Andrew Jackson and his presidency. So when we talk about Jackson democracy, um, not that people would have really used that term back then, um, but do people feel that, um, that, they, um, that the country was more democratic than it had been before? Uh, I think absolutely they did. Um, that they thought also that, that there was danger that it was out there. And, um, and Jackson told them who the danger was. Um, uh, to use a word that, that, that he employed 
with a group of um, bankers, Philadelphia bankers, um, he said the danger is the monster, the monster bank. We oftentimes like to put democracy on a pedestal as this perfect state uh, or this perfect system that when operated correctly is, you know, is, is just grand. Um, but the history of democracy shows anything but that. And I, I learned this very much when I did a deep dive into ancient Athenian democracy. But, but you can also, I mean, you, you can't separate the expansion of democracy in the 19th century from slavery and Indian removal. They're, they're all connected. Certainly, they're all connected. Um, you know, democracy is, um, is contested. And it's so very much culturally defined. We tend to think of it mostly in political terms. But really, you know, um, uh, the culture is going to play a key role um, in defining what the politics is as well. So, so certainly, um, you know, what, what, what do we mean? What do we mean by democracy? It's not, it's not mere numbers. Um, you know, sometimes um, in very casual language, we'll say things like um, uh, sectionalism in civil war. So uh, states like Mississippi and South Carolina, they, they wanted to secede from the Union. Um, they wanted to, um, to maintain the institution of slavery. And this seems sort of self-evident. And we kind of lazily think, because that's what most people in those states wanted. But then we take a step back and we realize that most people in those states were actually um, enslaved people. And that if it was all about um, maybe, you know, one of the purest forms of democracy, majority rule, that um, but that that outcome would not have, have transpired. Um, so, so democracy um, in Greece, um, democracy in Jackson's period, democracy in our period, um, these are not perfect overlaps. They evolve uh, depending upon what the culture uh, wants democracy to be. Andrew Jackson is us often said to be the founder of the Democratic Party. Is that accurate? Um, not if you go online and you look at the uh, Democratic Party's um, website. Um, I, 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 sh I should I should caution myself just a little bit there because it's been about a year since I've done this. But um, um, whether it's Jefferson, a Virginia slaveholder, or Jackson, uh, a Tennessee slaveholder, um, these two individuals have been scrubbed from the history. And uh, what the Democratic Party um, on its website has been portraying is, is more of a, of, of a recent history, um, uh, touting, for example, uh, the progressive period, um, the New Deal period, the civil rights movement, um, looking at Barack Obama with the Affordable Care Act. Um, yeah, historically, I, I, yeah, the roots do go back to Jackson. Um, and so, uh, yes, I, I think it's accurate to say that uh, in this country, the oldest political party uh, still in existence is the Democratic Party. And of course, the Democratic Party was very, very powerful in the South. It's um, it was most not powerful anymore, but in yeah. the South. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, again, I think that that's really about culture. It's not about politics. It's it's not it's not that. Um, um, oh, and you know, uh, and, and of course, um, you know, New England was a hotbed for Republican Party politics. Um, you know, uh, up until a certain point in our history. And so we talk about how it's it's so unusual that these political identities have changed. Um, but it's like what you're talking about with democracy. You know, these are sort of just terms. And, um, and, and what, what necessarily hasn't changed has been um, the cultural approach. So, for example, I, I think of, you know, um, uh, the 1850s. And, uh, you know, to be in New England and to be a reformer was to be a Republican. Um, today uh, to be in New England and to be reformers to be a Democrat. Well, I'm not sure that the labels are that important. Uh, what's important is, um, is what the people think and what they believe. And the party labels, they, um, uh, they uh, in some respects, they're almost incidental. Is it with the, the creation of the Democratic Party where we begin to see a two-party system? Yeah, we had a little bit of that earlier in American history. Um, there was the, um, the Hamiltonian Federalists, and there were the Jeffersonian Republicans, but that party, that, that partisan system doesn't really survive the, um, the War of 1812 
And so there's a brief period of time, just a brief period of time, in which it's just um, essentially every American considers um, uh, him or herself a Republican, a Jeffersonian. Uh, so, for example, in 1820, James Monroe runs for the presidency unopposed. And, and Monroe thinks that this is great. You know, we've, we've sort of gotten beyond our, our early differences, and now you know, we're going to move ahead uh, as, as, as one people, and, and we'll put sort of partisanship behind us. Well, obviously, you know, that, that didn't happen. Um, uh, for its time, it was a large country, and it was only getting larger. And the notion that you could sort of um, 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 you know, contain it within a single party, that didn't come to pass. Um, even today, you know, we've only got you know, two quote unquote major parties. The coalitions are very, very interesting. You know, um, you know, uh, all the groups that are in the Republican Party, all the groups that are in the Democratic Party, um, it's contentious, it's fractious. You've got some Republicans uh, who don't even recognize other Republicans as being uh, on their own. They'll, they'll name call them um, rhinos, for example. David S. Brown has been our guest. David Brown teaches history at Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania. He has joined us for a conversation about his book. It's called The First Populist, The Defiant Life of Andrew Jackson. David Brown, thank you very much. Nice to talk with you, Mitch.